Hidden Figures, Chapter 12, An Exceptional Mind. Like Mary Jackson, Catherine Gobble was a gifted mathematician who put her talents to work as a teacher. She was quite content with her life as a wife and mother, teaching math and French in Marion, Virginia. It would be years before she learned of the work being done at the NACA in Hampton, but everything would change in August 1952 when she attended a family wedding. At the wedding, Catherine's husband's brother-in-law told Catherine that the government was hiring black women to work as mathematicians at Langley. He knew she had studied mathematics in college and graduate school. He was the director of the Newsom Park Community Center where Dorothy Vaughn and her family lived. He knew Dorothy had quite a few of the women working for her in West, Compu in West Computing. Catherine listened carefully. She and her husband were public school teachers with modest paychecks. They had three daughters and had to manage their budget carefully to cover all of their family's needs. She enjoyed teaching and felt a sense of responsibility to advance the race by giving their students the best possible education even though they attended a segregated school schools with fewer resources, but now the mention of the opportunity at Langley reminded her of something she had almost forgotten, the dream of being a professional mathematician. After many years, it looked as if the dream just might come true. A mind for math. Catherine's father was a math whiz. Though educated only through the sixth grade, he could tell how much lumber a tree would yield just by looking at it. From the time she was a toddler, Catherine's parents realized that she had inherited her father's mind for math. Catherine, the youngest of four children, counted whatever crossed her path, dishes, steps, and stars in the sky. She excelled in school, especially in math. Whenever her teachers noticed that Catherine's desk was empty, they would look for her in the classroom next door where they would find her helping her older brother with his math lessons. Catherine graduated from high school at age 14. In 1933, she enrolled at West Virginia State Institute, a black college outside Charleston. By her junior year, she had tackled every math course the school offered, so her math professor created special advanced math classes just for her. You would... <clears throat> make a good research mathematician, her professor told Catherine when she was a sophomore. I am going to prepare you for this career. He believed in Catherine and her special ability, even though job prospects were poor. In the 1930s, employers openly discriminated against Irish and Jewish women with math degrees. The odds of a black woman finding work as a mathematician were especially low. After graduation, Catherine took a job teaching at the high school in Marion, Virginia. She met Jimmy Gobble, and they fell in love and married, but they kept their marriage secret. Catherine loved teaching, but at the time, the law didn't allow married women in the classroom as teachers. Unusually capable. In the spring of 1940, at the end of the busy school day, Catherine was surprised to find the president of her former college waiting outside her classroom. He said he had a special opportunity for her because no graduate programs were offered at any black colleges in the state, the all-white West Virginia University could be forced to admit African Americans to their graduate program in order to comply with the Supreme Court order. If a state didn't operate a separate graduate school for black students, it would be required to integrate its existing graduate schools. Since there were no graduate programs for black students in the entire state of West Virginia, the law said the white school had to open its doors to blacks. The governor of West Virginia didn't want to fight the law. Instead, he planned to integrate the state's public graduate school. He asked for the names of three unusually capable West Virginia State College graduates who might be willing to desegregate the university. Catherine was asked to be one of the three. The other two were men who would be entering the law school. Catherine accepted a place in the graduate school studying mathematics. On her last day teaching at the high school, Catherine's principal presented her with a full set of math reference books. He wanted her to succeed, and he feared that at one of the school's first black students, she might have trouble accessing the books she needed at the white school's library. Catherine enrolled in West Virginia University summer session. Her mother moved to Monogord, West Virginia, to room with her daughter, hoping to help her navigate what could be a difficult situation, the white students chose to bully her or call her names. As it turned out, most of the white students welcomed Catherine, and some went out of their way to be friendly. Only one classmate gave her any trouble, and that student just tried to insult Catherine by ignoring her. The professors treated her fairly, and Catherine more than met the academic standard. Her greatest challenge, finding a course that didn't repeat what she had already learned. At the end of the summer session, Catherine found that she and her husband were expecting a baby. Being quietly married was one thing, but having a baby was another. Catherine and her mother announced the news to her family, who were overjoyed, although they realized that she was going to have to leave school. 
Catherine became a full-time wife and mother. She and Aunt Jimmy eventually had three daughters. She never regretted putting life, family life ahead of graduate school. In 1944, Catherine took a teaching job at the local black high school to help support her family. She made it the job until she learned about the opportunity at Langley in 1952. A new life. After listening to their brother-in-law describe the job at Langley, Catherine and her husband, Jimmy, decided to take the leap and move to Newport News. When they arrived, they moved into an apartment in Newsom Park. Her husband got a stable, well-paid job as a painter at the Newport News Shipping Yard. The three children loved their new school and marveled at being part of such a large and dynamic black community. Langley's personal department approved Catherine's job application as a computer in 1952, but she didn't start work until June 1953. In the meantime, she worked as a substitute math teacher at the high school, which allowed her to meet a lot of families in the area. She was involved with her sorority and her church. She developed a social network and met the women who would become lifelong best friends. Eunice Smith, who lived three blocks away, was a nine-year veteran at West Computing. When Catherine started work, she and Eunice decided to drive to the office together. It was a great surprise for Catherine to find... <clears throat> Not only that her new boss, Dorothy Vaughn, was a fellow West Virginian, but that her, their families had once been neighbors. It didn't take long for Catherine to appreciate that Dorothy wasn't just a talented mathematician, she was also a great supervisor. For two weeks, Catherine worked at her new desk in West Computing, hitting the ground running. Then one morning, an engineer came into the office and quietly conferred with Dorothy. The Flight Research Division needed two new computers. Dorothy Vaughn announced the Flight Research Division was a group that specialized in testing real planes rather than wind tunnels. Catherine and Irma, I'm sending the two of you, assigning Catherine and another West computer to the job. Confusing signals. For Catherine being given an assignment, the Flight Research Division, whose office was on the top floor of Langley's gigantic hangar, felt like good fortune. She had been elated to work in the pool and calculate her way through the data sheets, but being sent to work closely with the engineers was even more exciting. With just her lunch bag and purse to carry, Catherine went over to the hangar, which was a short walk from the West Computing Office. She slipped in the side door, climbed the stairs, and walked down a dim cinder block hallway to the Flight Research Laboratory. Inside the room smelled like coffee and cigarettes. The engineers smoked and drank coffee all day while they were working. Like West Computing, the office was set up in a classroom style with about 20 desks. Most of the people on the team were men, but there were a few other women in the group. Working as computers, Catherine looked for a place to wait for her new bosses. She went to an empty cube and sat down next to a white engineer. Before she had a chance to say hello, the man gave her a sideways glance, then got up and walked away. Had she done something wrong? No one else noticed what happened, but Catherine didn't know whether his action was meant to be insulting. It could have been because she was black and he was white. It could have been because she was a woman and he was a man. It could have been because he was a professional and she was a sub-professional, or could have meant nothing at all. Outside the Langley campus, the rules were clear. Blacks and whites lived separately, ate separately, studied separately, socialized separately, worshipped separately, and for the most part, worked separately. And Langley, the boundaries were fuzzy. Said to ask you. Some of her colleagues were northerners or foreigners who never so much as met a black person before arriving at Langley. Others were from the deep south with strong attitudes about racial mixing. It was all part of the racial relations laboratory at Langley. Blacks and whites were exploring new ground together. Catherine and the other black mathematicians mounted a charm offensive. They made a special effort to always be well-dressed, well-spoken, patriotic, and upright. They were cleanly aware that the interactions that individual blacks had with whites could have implications for the entire black community. Within two weeks, whatever had caused the engineer to move away from Catherine's desk had faded from mind as the two got to know one another. The man was more than pleased when he discovered that his new office mate was a fellow transplant from West Virginia, and they became fast friends. West Virginia never left Catherine's heart, but Virginia, it would soon be clear, was her destiny.